Hi, well here we are again. It's Mark from the Quick doing another of these videos. As you can probably tell by now, we have some ACCA paper P4 training coming up. So a good way to prep for it is to prepare these little videos. And they, they do so well. We get lots of comments, which I like. So thank you very much for the comments. Um, and I hope everyone can hear us. So there's one lady on YouTube here, right, that she had problems with the sound. So I hope that the, the sound is okay. And as I say that, an aeroplane flies overhead. A nice bit of sound interference there. Right, today's little class, therefore, is on Medigliani and Miller. Um, Medigliani and Miller are two guys who came up with the theory of capital structure. So just to go back, the capital asset pricing model, if you remember, was, was built on the premise, on the foundations that were set by uh, portfolio theory. And we were looking, therefore, at risk and return. So capital asset pricing model is risk and return. If we know the risk of a share, we can predict the price of that share. That's capital asset pricing model. What we're looking at here is Medigliani and Miller. Now, Medigliani and Miller were looking at a completely different topic. Now, in later videos, you'll say they come together. But for now, the, the topic that we're looking at is capital structure. Now, they were writing that they wrote Medigliani and Miller 1 in 1958. So it's already, what is it, nearly 60 years ago. But before that, the basic premise was that a company had an optimal capital structure. So if you think, if you're running a company, um, your objective, one of your, your duties as a director is to minimize your costs, and so to minimize the, the cost to the business, and obviously one of those costs is the cost of capital. Traditional conventional theory tells us that, that we can do that, that we can actually cut our cost of capital by coming up with some ideal capital structure. Okay, so that's part number one. So that's, that was the original theory, and, and everybody always thought that. So to a large degree, it wasn't really written down. Now, I know that academics are going to go, no, there were thousands of papers that proved this. And, and they're right, there were thousands of papers. But we didn't have one definitive theory that, that came up with this idea. Medigliani and Miller came along, 1958, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they said that, no, that's not true. And I'll show you as we go through this, the theories that they came up with. But they completely revol revolutionized the, the theory of, of capital structure. Right, that's our starting point. That's the introduction. I'm Mark Fielding Pritchard, and, and you know where you can, you can find me now. And many of you already have. Um, just one thing to say about this. Uh, as an ex-examiner on this topic, having written mock exams for various training companies on the subject, Students tend to go one of two ways with this. And bearing in mind that Medigliani and Miller both won Nobel Prizes for Economics for this work. Both of them both of them won Nobel Prizes for Economics for this work. Um, one of two ways. Students either go, this is the biggest load of nonsense ever. How can this rubbish ever be taught anywhere in a classroom? Or they go to the opposite extreme and go, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and kids should learn this at age of seven. And on, on that basis, therefore, everybody should have to learn this as part of their education and it's completely wonderful. Your P4 examiner has said, and he's absolutely correct in this, I totally agree with him, that Medigliani and Miller is a model. So Medigliani, Medigliani and Miller is, is a financial model within the constraint of the model it does what they said it does. But you need to understand that it is a model with certain constraints, and many of those constraints are, let's call them, different from real life. So that, that's the basis that I want you to take from it. In terms of what you need to know for the exam, there's various graphs that go with this. Um, there's a formula. The graphs and the formula I have never seen in 25 years of teaching what's now paper P4, what used to be 3.7, and before that paper 14, I have never seen any of that examined. What you do need to know, because you're going to build on this in the future, and when we come to adjusted present value and we come to what your examiner calls the traditional net present value, when you come to that, you need to know the assumption. Okay? So when you're studying this, we're going to talk through the theories briefly, but please, you do need to know what the assumptions are, because later we're going to say, well, you do this, you do it, this, blah, blah, blah with these things, and if you don't understand the assumptions, you won't understand what we're doing. Okay, so please get those assumptions. Have a look at the graphs and see what they said. If you're really, really interested, and I have had chance to do this in the past, go away and, and read the read the pieces that Medigliani and Miller wrote. It's actually pretty interesting. 
well, a little bit interesting. Okay. Okay, so we've moved across to the boardroom now. So I'm recording this, waiting for a meeting to start. Right, have a look at this slide now. Now, remember what I told you. I told you that Mazigliani and Miller is a theory, okay? So we're now looking at Mazigliani and Miller's first theory, which they put forward in 1958. And the easiest way to understand this is by looking at a graph. So let's just have a little look at a graph and make sure that we're clear on what's happening. On the bottom axis, so on the horizontal axis, we've got gearing ratio. So it's telling us that the capital of the company, remember what we're looking at is, can we reduce cost of capital by changing our gearing structure? So along the bottom, we are looking at our gearing ratio. So the capital of the company, the capital of the organization is staying fixed, but as we move across that bottom line, more and more of that capital is in the form of debt, and therefore less and less is in the form of equity. So we've got this idea of debt and equity as our two different sources of finance, and as we move from left to right, and my hand on your screen moves the opposite direction, as we move from left to right, the gearing ratio is rising. On the left-hand side, we have cost. So therefore, with our cost, we have some, some percentage cost, our cost of equity and our cost of debt. Right, your cost of debt is basically the organization's uh, interest rate that it has to pay on its debt. Cost of equity is made up of dividends and capital gains. Now you may say, well, there's no cost to capital gains, um, but there is because the organization has to keep going. If, if equity holders do not get their required rate of return on their equity, then they will sell their shares, the value of the shares will go down, and so on. So therefore, we've got this idea of cost of equity. Right, make sure that you're okay therefore with those concepts in your mind, that you're happy what the graph shows you. You'll see cost up the left hand, up the vertical axis, and you will see gearing ratio along the bottom. The orangey ready line is cost of equity, and the bottom green line is cost of debt. Now let's have a look at what those two lines are doing. Cost of debt and cost of equity. So KD is cost of debt, now you will see therefore that the cost of debt is constant. Now we'll look at the assumptions in a minute, but Medigliani and Miller assumed that cost of debt was constant. In fact, they went on further to say that corporate debt was risk-free. So corporate debt is considered to be risk-free. Okay? So that's why it's a constant. And you'll see your, go your gearing goes from 0% to 100%. And as it does that, the cost of debt stays the same because corporate debt is risk-free. Now look at the orange line, which goes in a straight line up the page. And it's, it's important that you understand that that is a straight line. So my graph skills are not that great, but they've kind of worked here. Right, what's happening with cost of equity is that as your gearing ratio rises, so your cost of, e so your cost of equity rises. Yeah, I said that correctly. As your gearing ratio rises, so your cost of equity rises. Now that orange line is a straight line. Therefore, that is a linear relationship. So as we add one dollar or one pound of debt to our balance sheet, the cost of equity will rise proportionately. Right, make sure that you're clear on that. The cost of equity will rise proportionately. Okay? So we've got cost of debt and cost of equity. Now as gearing rises, the cost of equity rises. Right, I hope you're clear on your bottom green line, which is the cost of debt, and your orange line, which is the cost of equity. Cost of equity will rise as gearing rises. Right, Medigliani and Miller took that mathematical relationship one step further. What they said is that as you issue debt, as you issue debt, debt is cheaper. So what we would expect everything else being equal, is for our cost of capital to fall. So Medigliani and Miller said debt is cheaper than equity, which is true in real life, it must be true, because debt payers get paid first on or before um, equity holders on a liquidation. So we're saying therefore debt is cheaper, therefore more debt, less equity, we would think everything else being equal, that our average cost of capital, our overall cost of capital would fall. But Medigliani and Miller said it doesn't fall. Your overall cost of capital doesn't fall because as you have more debt, 
your cost of equity rises. Right, now have a look at exactly what they're saying mathematically. As you issue more debt, your debt is cheaper, but your cost of equity rises. And the cost of equity rises at such a rate that your weighted average cost of capital, so now look at your middle line, the darker one on my screen appears to be a darker green line, but the middle one, yeah, so the middle line that says WACC, right, as your gearing ratio rises, your cost of equity rises, and the effect is that your average cost of capital stays exactly the same, okay? Right, that is the conclusion of this. So the conclusion of Medigliani and Miller 1 is that capital structure is irrelevant because your cost of capital will stay the same, okay? So Medigliani and Miller 1, cost of capital stays the same, okay? And that is because as your gearing ratio rises, you have more cheap debt, but the cost of equity rises, and the cost of equity rises, and those two things exactly balance each other out. Right, there's a lot of assumptions in there. Cost of debt, so debt is risk-free. So corporate debt is risk-free, which we know in real life is not true. Right, cost of equity, your cost of equity rises as your gearing ratio rises, and it rises as a proportionate straight line. Okay, and Miller one. Now let's go and look at more of the assumptions because there's a whole load more of assumptions connected to this. Okay, the, the assumptions are underpinned. And now the assumptions are huge. Now remember back to what I said at the beginning, your examiner understands and accepts that this is a model. If we treat it as a model and we accept the assumptions, then, then the thing works. And that's the approach that you need in the exam. Right, what assumptions did they make? The first one we've already talked about, in fact, the first two we've already talked about on the previous slide. So corporate debt is risk-free, and that's where we get that straight line. Secondly, the relationship between the cost of equity and the gearing, and gearing is a linear relationship, and that's why that also is a straight line. Cost of equity goes up your graph like that. Yes, that way. And your cost of debt goes like that. Right, the effect, therefore, is as your gearing ratio rises, we have more cheap debt in our balance sheet, but the cost of equity rises. The savings from issuing debt are exactly matched out, or exactly wiped out by the rises in the cost of equity. And therefore it says there in big black letters, optimal capital structure, it doesn't matter, because the cost of equity will automatically self-adjust when debt is issued or redeemed. Okay? So you're just moving backwards and forwards across the straight line, and while the straight line doesn't go up or down, your cost of capital doesn't change. Right, let's just have a look at some of the other assumptions that there are there for. <coughs> right, for this thing to work um, in, 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 its, in its model environment, there has to be absolutely perfect free movement between debt and equity. So there has to be instantaneous movement. So in other words, if you hold bonds and you want to sell them and buy equity, you have to be able to do that free of any encumbrances. So there must be no barriers. That. There must be no time limit, there must be no costs, and there are no transaction costs. You have to be able to switch completely freely between the two of them. You have to be able to do that because if you don't, then, then your, your graph, people will accept a lower rate of return on their equity because they can't be bothered to sell, sell their item. Yeah? So we have to have this free movement between the two that, that does not in any way hinder us from moving from debt to equity or equity to debt. The second thing is that there must be no tax. But there must be no tax for two reasons. The first reason is the same as the reason I've just said, that debt, if you receive interest on these things, or if you receive capital gains or whatever, that there will be some tax liability. So there may be some tax liability. Now remember that your return is earned from holding a share. Yeah? So therefore, there's no tax if you hold a share. But if you take debt, for example, there is tax on the interest. Similarly, dividends attract interest. If you sell the shares to, at the point of disposal to move from one to the other, they will be taxed. So all of these things will distort because they stop you from moving from one to the other. So therefore, there must be no tax. Right, the second reason that there must be no tax is that your graph is two-dimensional. So you have returns against gearing. If you have tax in there, you'd have to have a third element, which is the tax element. And therefore, your graph would become three-dimensional and it would stop making any sense. So there must be no tax at all. 
No tax because tax will hinder us from selling shares to move to debt. It will also hinder us from taking debt because the interest is subject to tax. And also this idea that your graph won't work if you have tax as well. Right, the final thing is that there must be perfect information. So in other words, if you're an equity holder, let's assume that the company issues £10 or $10 of debt. Right, that will affect you. According to Medigliani and Miller, you see that there is £10 of debt extra in the balance sheet, even though the company is Chrysler or someone who actually funded this. Um, so this ten pounds, so your, your required rate of return of equity rises. Right. So therefore, there has to be perfect information. If there's no perfect information, then you wouldn't know that there was any additional debt or that some debt had been redeemed. You wouldn't therefore adjust your, your, your risk return requirement. Okay, so perfect information. Right, you need to know this stuff because this is actually more important than the graph because this is what's going to hit you when you come later on. Okay. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at traditional theory. Now this, as far as I've been able to, to see, was never ever formally written down, but traditional theory is something that, that teachers always teach and you should know what, theory, what traditional theory is so that you can... Uh, put it next to Medigliani and Miller and compare them. So in our graph, I think my colours have changed, but you've got the same three lines. There. So have a look, therefore, you've got cost of equity, you've got cost of debt, and you've got weighted average cost of capital. Now, the effect of what's happening with debt, you'll see over here at the bottom it says gearing on your axis. So you've got the same two axes again. The gearing, it says 0%. So at 0%, 0% there is no debt, so the cost is 0%. Yeah? Right, at 10% you will see that we have a level of debt. And then what's happening with our cost of debt line, cost of debt is the bottom green line. Yeah. You'll see at 10% it has a value, which I forget what I put into the, the Excel chart producer, but it's something like 5%. At 20% of gearing it rises, but not markedly. 30% it, it rises. And then what happens at 30% is it begins to rise more and more quickly. With your cost of debt, you get a relatively straight line to begin with, but then as gearing rises, it will begin to pitch up. And it rises and rises. Okay? So that's what's happening with your with your cost of debt line. I hope you're okay with that. Right, cost of equity does something which is broadly similar. So across low levels of gearing, it will stay relatively stable. Once again, we agree with Medigliani and Miller, cost of equity is higher than cost of equity, but you'll see with cost of equity, that it stays low levels of gearing up to about 30%, it will stay relatively stable, and then it will again make this up curve shape when suddenly investors become aware of the increased gearing and they require a higher rate of return. The other thing that you should notice as well, which I hope my graph shows, is that the equity holders will have this upswing before the debt holders because they get paid later, so the, the, risk, the risk is greater for them. So we get this idea of a straight line, upswing, straight line, upswing in cost of debt and cost of equity. The effect on your weight of average cost of capital, if it's visible, is that as your gearing ratio is going from zero to about 30% there, your weight of average cost of capital is actually falling. Because if your cost of equity is level, as you're issuing debt, the debt is cheaper. So your average cost of capital is falling until you hit a point when you start to get these upswings. And then the weighted average cost of capital will give you an upswing. So cost of equity, straight upswing, cost of debt, straight upswing, but the upswing comes after with the debt. The weighted average cost of capital will fall along low levels of gearing, and then it will join the upswing as well. Right, and this is the whole point of this thing. Therefore, the, the conclusion of traditional theory is that there is an optimal capital structure. So we can have an optimal gearing structure for our organization, and that we can find that. And, and that is what directors should seek to do. So that's traditional theory, completely the opposite of Medigliani and Miller. Okay, previous examiners, I don't know about the current one, but previous examiners have criticised this, believe it or not, because this is what common sense tells you happens. And the reason that they've criticised it is for two reasons. The first reason is that whilst it gives us this idea that there is an optimal capital structure, it does not tell us where it is. 
Now on my graph, the, the middle green line hit the bottom at about 30%, but that's just because I made up some numbers. That is not meant to tell you that that is the optimal capital structure. Though we'll come back to that in a second. So first criticism of this from previous examiners has been that it does not tell you where the optimal capital structure is. The second thing is that if you can find it, and it's very, very difficult, but for quoted companies, you ought to be able to find it, it, it moves. You, you go, you get your quote from, from Bloomberg or wherever, you calculate your optimal capital structure, yes, it's at 32%, but as the, share price, as the share price moves, even one cent, the optimal capital structure will move as well. Okay, So therefore, examiners have tended not to particularly like this. The latest one seems to be more practical than previous ones. But historically, examiners have not liked this. Right, there is one example from real life. Now, the example from real life is called Southern Water Authority. Southern Water Authority was, sorry, I've got that wrong. It's the Southern Electric Corporation. So the Southern Electric Corporation. In Britain, what happened was, was that Margaret Thatcher privatized the electricity board. Now, there was one electricity board, and you can understand that these things are monopolies, yeah? So they put their prices up, and, and they made big profits. Now, in the south of England, around about towns like Southampton, was the SEB, which was historically called the Southern Electricity Board. This became a company, and their job is to provide electricity. They don't produce, they just distribute. So the, the Southern Electric Board distributes electricity. And they reached a point when they had vast sums of vast sums of money in their balance sheet and they didn't know what to do with it. So what they did was they paid all of their debts. They became what Rodigliani and Miller would call an ungeared company. A company with no gearing in its balance sheet at all. What happened? Their share price went down. Great. So they went to their shareholders and they said, look, we're ungeared. We're a risk-free company. There's no risk attached to this. Why is our share price gone down? And the market came back to them and it said, well, look, we think you should have a cheaper cost of capital if you had some debt in your balance sheet. There should be a mix between debt and equity. And so Southern Electric said, okay, well, what do you think? So the market told them something like, and they, they had shareholders meetings to discuss this. And the shareholders analysts told them 30%, try 30%. So they did, they issued bonds to the value of 30% of their capital, raised a whole load of money, and, um, and bingo, their share price went back up again. So in terms of practical real life, in terms of practical real life, the stock market will tell companies that you should have some gearing in your balance sheet. That unless there's a very specific reason, they don't like you to be ungeared. And Southern Electric Board is the answer to that. To, if you're wondering what happened further down the line, they got over all of their problems. They invested in a company called Leon Water, and Leon Water turned out to be a hugely disastrous investment, and they got rid of all their money. So there you go. It worked. Everything worked out well in the end. Right, that is traditional theory. Okay. Okay, un undeterred by practical concerns, Medigliani and Miller continued. Right, please can you notice that Medigliani and Miller wrote something like 15 different um, theories going on to look at cost of bankruptcy, going on to look at dividend policy. Um, you only need to know, for the purposes of ACCA paper P4, 1 and 2, um, and you need to know dividend policy. And we'll do, we'll, do another, we'll do another video on dividend policy. Right, so you only need to know 1 and 2 for the exam. So forget all the stuff about bankruptcy costs and, and so on and so forth that came later. And Norman Miller went on forever writing about these things. I think he was he moved to the University of Chicago. Medigliani and Miller was Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Right, Medigliani and Miller too. Right, there is only one difference between this and Medigliani and Miller one. Okay, so there's only one difference. Everything else is the same. And that difference is that debt interest qualifies for tax relief. Okay, everything else is the same. So if you look at your graph now, what you should find is that the cost of debt, which is the bottom green line, has actually moved down the graph. Um, that probably isn't clear from me, and I apologize, that's my bad graph drawing. But um, the reality is that that should have moved down the graph. Because your, your 
cost of debt has just got lower and lower by the, the tax saving. Yeah, your cost of equity has stayed the same. In fact, your cost of equity should move slightly down because the risk is reduced. If your debt cost is reduced, then the risk to the company is reduced as gearing. But that orange line, and it's really not clear from my terrible graph, should actually still be a straight line, and it's still a straight line, and it's still a linear relationship. So broadly, the orange line and the bottom green line are exactly the same and haven't changed. Right, what has changed is the weighted average cost of capital, which is the middle line. Because now, previously, can I say that now previously? Right, previously, debt was a straight line, equity was a straight line, weighted average cost of capital was a straight line. But what's just happened to you now is that your is that your debt has got cheaper. So if your debt has got cheaper, equity has stayed the same, now your average cost of capital will reduce as you issue more debt. And that is the conclusion of this thing. The Optimal capital structure is 100% debt. Okay. Now, in their findings, they actually didn't recommend it. Believe it or not, they wrote this is the conclusion of our work, but we don't recommend that you do that. Yeah, brilliant, huh? But that's what they're saying. Right, orange line is still a straight line. Green line at the bottom, cost of debt is a straight line across the bottom. But now debt just got cheaper. So your average cost of capital declines. Therefore, all of the assumptions are exactly the same as they were before, except for one, except for one, and that is that corporate debt interest qualifies for tax relief. Now, when you look at this in the book, you'll see it called Medigliani and Miller with tax. It's not with tax. We're still ignoring capital gains tax. We're still ignoring income tax on dividends. It's only this corporate debt relief in the hands of the company that qualifies for tax relief. Most important thing in terms of this is the conclusion that optimal capital structure, 100% debt, even though Medigliani and Miller themselves didn't recommend it. Okay, so this slide is very, very simple. It's exactly the same as the previous one, yeah? Freedom of movement between debt and equity, no tax, perfect information. The only difference now is that debt interest qualifies for tax relief. It's everything that I've told you before. Um, corporate debt is still considered to be risk-free. Cost of equity still has a linear relationship. Um, but look at the conclusion. 100% debt is the optimal capital structure. Students really struggle with that as a mental idea. Um, it's what the voice said. It's what your examiner wants you to learn. Learn it, remember it on the day, and then forget it. Okay, so you, you kind of done the main bit. We just have one more little bit to do, which I guess we just really have to do for completeness more than anything else. Uh, um, in the exam, you'll be given a formula sheet, and on the formula sheet, you will have Medigliani and Miller's formula. So I've reproduced the exact formula that you will have there, and you just really need to know what all of these things mean, because obviously ACCA give you these formulas, but they don't tell you what they mean. So KE is cost of equity, KE with a little U above it is the cost of equity in an ungeared business. Remember oh, this Medigliani and Miller too. Yeah. So is the cost of equity in the same business as if it were ungeared? Uh, remember that the, your, there is a direct proportional relationship between gearing and your cost of equity. So what's the cost of equity were the business to be ungeared? Um, and then we add to that 1 minus T. T is the tax rate. Uh, KUE again is cost of equity ungeared minus KD. KD is the cost of debt and then multiplied by VD over VE. VD is the market value of the debt and VE is the market value of the equity. Right, please notice you are always, always, always dealing with market values. And you are going to probably, you are probably going to get this in the exam, um, but we'll show you in a later video when we look at things called the traditional net present value and the and the APV, how it will be examined. I've never ever seen this formula used in the exam. So I'm just doing this for completeness now. So KE is your geared cost of equity. Uh, da, 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 KEU, ungeared cost of equity. So that's the cost of equity in the company or what it would be if the company had no debt at all. So ungeared cost of equity, what would be the cost of equity 
if the company was totally ungeared, that only had equity, no debt at all. T is the tax rate, KD is the cost of debt, and VD is market value of debt, and VE market value of equity. And you just have to remember, and again, it's not so hard to remember, you're always, always, always dealing with market values and the Medigliani and Miller. Okay, and actually I just read that formula, rolled that off, and I hadn't even realized I'd written this stuff on the name. Okay, I'll give you a little example on the next slide. Okay, so you should take a little bit of notice of this because this is where you're going with this thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little example, and the example is going to give us the weighted average cost of capital. The WACC is weighted average cost of capital. Right, this is important because what's going to happen to you in the exam is you're going to have to do a, a cash flow, good old-fashioned cash flow, and it's assumed at this paper that you know how to do that, so there won't actually be that many marks for it. So you do the cash flow, and then where the chunky marks will be is calculation of the discount rate. Now that's what we're going to use capital asset pricing model Medigliani and Miller for, is this idea of calculation of a discount rate. Then in the exam you get your discount rate, you use your discount rate, discount your cash flow, and it gives you a yes no decision based on, on whether it's positive or negative. So let's just have a little example here, then I'll give you an example of a company that tells you that Kennedy is a company in the fast food industry, so they're making lovely greasy food. Um, right, the cost of equity of McDonald's as ungeared is 9%. Right, what that is, what that is telling you therefore is that the risk of the fast food industry is 9%. So we can, we can assume, therefore, that our company, being in the same industry, will have the same business risk. Okay. Now, when you, you need to look at capital asset pricing model here to see this idea that companies in the same industry will have the same level of risk if we just look at the market risk itself. So please watch the video on capital asset pricing model and you'll understand why we can make that assumption. But our assumption is that the ungeared cost of equity of McDonald's is 9%, and so therefore we can use the ungeared cost of equity of 9% as our ungeared cost of equity. Same industry, same market risk. Go back and look at capital asset pricing model. Everyone has the same level of market risk if they're in the same industry. So your ungeared cost of equity in terms of your formula, therefore, is 9%. Right, T-bills are yielding 3% annually. Right, this is your risk-free rate. In, in real life, you have a problem with risk-free rates because there's no such thing as a risk-free security. And if you look, therefore, at the rates of return that you're earning on British pounds, so, so gilt, in other words, British, British government securities, they will be different from the rates of, of, that you are earning in America on, on T-bills. T-bills are treasury. Um, similarly, T-bills, treasury bills that have a one-year maturity will have a different yield for maturity from two years, from three years, from four years to, and, and there are even some some which are irredeemable, so that they never ever they never ever mature. Right. What what happens in real life is that when these guys who are doing this capital asset pricing model stuff in universities work, they take five year T bills. So T bills are treasury bills. What your examiner is telling you here, the examiner being me, is that um, your risk free rate of interest is three percent. Okay. When you see that in the exam as well. You should assume, you should assume, therefore, that that is before tax. So in other words, that's gross before tax. Okay? So assume that it's gross before tax. So you set the tax out. Right, it tells us that Kennedy has a gearing ratio of 20% on book value. Right, when we talk about gearing ratios, we're talking debt to equity. So therefore, 20% of your 20% of your debt on market values and 80% is equity. So 20% of your capital of your business is debt, 80% is equity. If I just move this over a little bit here, it tells us that on market values it's 10%. So the market value of your capital, 10% is debt, 90% is equity. Remember, we always, always, always work on the basis of market values. So what's Kennedy's whack? So with cost of equity, which is the cost of equity geared, is equal to the cost of equity ungeared, which is 9%. 1 minus the tax rate is 0.7, because the tax rate is 30%, given to you on the slide. Cost of equity ungeared is 9. Cost of debt is 3. And then market value of the debt is 10. Market value of the equity is 9. 
count. So we've got 1 over 9, 10 over 90, whatever way you want to put it, 100 over 900, but it'll give you the same proportion. Multiply those numbers through, and all using some magic. If, if my calculations are correct, you get a cost of equity of 9.5%. Okay? If I remember correctly, it doesn't come out exactly, so I've rounded it to 9.5 from whatever it was before. Right, the only thing to say about that, and this is the only mistake that students make, is they go, oh, 9.5%, that's, um, that's my discount rate, uh, and it's not your discount rate. That is your cost of equity. What you are required to calculate and what will be your discount rate will be your weighted average cost of capital. So 9.5 is the cost of 90% of your capital, and the cost of debt is the other 10%. So you've got, if you look there, you've got 9.5 times 90%, that's your cost of equity. Then you've got three, which is your cost of debt, multiplied by 0.7, because you're taking out the tax. So you're multiplying it, 0.7 is one minus the tax rate, and then 10% is the proportion of capital, which is in the form of debt. So multiply that thing through, and you get something like 8.76. Whatever, whatever number you come at, please, please check that number. No doubt someone will write and tell me if it's wrong. Right, remember that in the, in the exam you'll have tables with you, so don't use 8.76 and try and do a five year, and oh, God forbid if you've got annuities and stuff, just round it to the nearest number. Um, the examiner in past exams has actually rounded it down. Now, I really, really don't like rounding it down because I think you could go from, you could, it could give you it could give you a wrong decision. You could, if it's very close to, to net present value of zero, you could go from a negative number to a positive number rounding down. So I personally would always round up. Your examiner doesn't seem to bother. So whatever makes the most sense for you. But round it to the nearest number, and then you use that as your discount rate. Okay, there you go. That's Medigliani and Miller. Um, Medigliani and Miller comes up in the exam fairly rarely. You've been asked to comment it on it in the past. Um, if you're asked to comment, you talk about Medigliani and Miller 2, it's been three or four marks, that's all, so you just have to know what's on the page with the graph. And you need to know the assumptions. What's in the exam all the time, though, is this idea of producing the weighted average cost of capital. Now, we've done a video on capital asset pricing model, so you should make sure you're watching these as a series. Watch the one on portfolio theory. Portfolio theory is really important in real life. People in big equity firms use it all the time. In the exam, not so much. But you need to understand portfolio theory so you can understand capital asset pricing model. Capital asset pricing model is not used in real life, but it's all over your exams. And this is what we're building to, this idea of development of, development of um, discount rates. Now, You've got, therefore, portfolio theory and capital asset pricing model work together looking at how we look at risk and return on, on, on individual shares. Medigliani and Miller look at this idea of capital structure. What's going to happen to you in the next video, therefore, is those two things are going to come together, and that is what's going to be in your exam. Okay, so that's really important in terms of your exam. And you should definitely make sure that the next one is the one that you really know and can kill off in the exam. This is not difficult. But you have to understand the assumptions of all this stuff to get to the next stage. Okay, my name is Mark. Hope you had a great time watching that. That's a great time is the right phrase. I uh, hope it was useful. Best of luck with your studies. And I uh, hope you pass your exam. Good luck, guys. You know where we are. So if you have any questions, please send them in. It's best to send them to the website rather than through YouTube. Because I only look at YouTube once a month or something. Whereas if you send it to the website, it, it pops up in my business email. Okay, best of luck, guys. Bye-bye.